Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for inviting me. I divided my presentation into two parts. This is a map I prepared. This is the map of technologies in agriculture showing, of course, uh, you can have access to this presentation. It will be available for you. This is uh, an overview of, if I were to write a book about it, uh, how I would classify technologies from this area. So different production with new technologies, the use of new technologies uh, in production, new applications between different sectors, and I divided it into categories as for the development of technology. This is how I would call it. What is a common factor here is data and money. Of course, in technologies, everything is related to money. The first part of my presentation is rather remote. Uh, I will make it more personal, uh, personalized in the second part. I would like to um, you to refrain from agriculture and focus on data as such. And in the second part, we will go back to your sector so that the data you are going to hear in the first presentation uh, superimpose on various innovations and categories of innovations. This is how I plan my presentation. Everything I'm talking about is called dataism or the cult of data. Data in the center. So data self, data centric approach. We talk about selfism. When I meet startups, innovators, they talk how much data they collect, that they need to have synthetic data, so untrue data. They say that they collect data from our selfies, especially if we talk about behavior-related or biometric data. This is not just the visual aspect, but very often biometric data or metadata, so information when the photograph was taken, uh, which uh, camera uh, and um, a resolution. So this is selfism. And um, I was wondering whether this, when this selfism started, some people say it started when World Trade Center was attacked. And I agree, yes, this was significant element in the technology development. It showed us that data can collect significant amount of data to provide, to ensure security. Uh, people just allowed to introduce technologies with gathering a significant uh, data, but September 2020, these two people realized that they are not earning money. They developed a browser with millions of users around the world, but they are generating losses, not profits. They realize that, unfortunately, you are not earning money on providing knowledge. You are earning money on uh, our footprint we leave while looking for different information. And they decided to go this way. They decided to develop something we we know as Google Ads or Google Ad Work, the significant driving force for profits. So copying this model, this behavior, looking at Google that was developed through this innovation uh, into a biggest player, but was also uh, profitable. This was the beginning of ICT era. In September, I was in Krakow at a Congress megabyte bomb for Jimmy Wells, the Wikipedia establisher. We were talking about Wikipedia today, and he showed me statistics, how much he could earn if we use digital footprint and how much they use without this footprint, asking about some donation, asking about uh, participation. Google as first around the world uh, photographed every inch of our globe. Thanks to Google Street View, Google Air, we know with 8 billion people around the world, if we were to provide all with the standard of living as average US citizen, we would need four and a half 
planets or of and a half globes. This is a photograph from 94. This is Bill Gates. In 94, he wanted to promote his first CD-ROM. He has it in his hand, and he wanted to show how much data is gathered on one CD. This is the number of paper he sits on to uh, record on the CD. So uh, we had a lot of publications referring to it, referring to this data, because he, he's showing two different aspects. He refers to data. If now Bill Gates wants to do the same uh, uh, photograph with a pen drive, he would have to need uh, on the highest building in Dubai right now, the highest, still the highest building in the world. But there is one more aspect, uh, close to you and close to agriculture. This is ecology and climate transformation. So let's imagine that Bill Gates today, he's sitting on a pile of paper in the middle of the forest. So you would pay attention to this fact, how can he used the paper made out of the trees so we can see a revolution in value throughout these years. So this is uh, very uh, visible in our trends. We say that algorithms determine every tenth minute of our life, and this is so. I'm not talking here about a very well-known algorithm. We uh, wake up, take phone, we go through TikTok, uh, Instagram, Onet, Interia, Vintuana Polska, every uh, portals we uh, visit, what you see, this is your digital world. I can show you a website, Onet, I'm co-founder. In the left corner, you have breaking news, the most important aspect. This is not profiled, so when you open uh, the page, you will see exactly the same. Uh, on the main page, not profiled, uh, this is gossip. This is in every news at the bottom. You need to scroll the whole page to take to, to, to see the gossip. We want to know what Gosia Rozenek is talking about over coffee. We need to scroll that down to reach that information. And we uh, know that from breaking news to gossip, you will find something interesting, but this is too little. It, it cannot be something. So we analyze your digital footprint and we segment the website to reflect your preferences. Somebody could say, why not left or right corner? So we are talking about uh, that by default, we pay attention, right-handed person pays attention to the upper side, the left side of the page. So this is the breaking news. You don't have it on the right side, on the left side. So if we are fed up with algorithm, you are checking uh, your phone with the app uh, where you can have electric scooter because you want to go from Sheraton to a railway station in Sopot. One app shows you that it is 300 uh, meters away from you, and uh, you can see this is free. Why the app is not going to check this? Uh, it it turns out this one close to the conference center is free. So why the app was not showing you that? But the app uh, show uh, the app knew that the user of this scooter uh, is there in the Sheraton Hotel, very impatient. The person will not walk 300 meters. And if they uh, see that the vacant scooter is far away, he is not going to use it. So uh, the, the app also calculates how much time passes by from ordering an electric scooter. Uh, so adjusting your behavior. So this time, uh, maybe you don't want an electric scooter, you want Bolt, Uber, or and again, application uh, is uh, is using information for the same two people in Sheraton Hotel from the same conference. One uh, uh, takes 
a car from Gdańsk, one from a, a, a driver in Sopot. This is not random. The application is collecting money who's patient, who's not patient. Whether you look at the time, whether this is long way, long time to wait, you give up. Whether this is short time, you take it. Whether you prolong, this is the algorithm, this is the data we are talking about. Then you reach the station, you stop on, you order electronic ticket. Algorithm is going to site where you are going to sit next to, from Gdańsk or Sopot to Warsaw. Uh, so this is the power of algorithm. I was thinking about the wall, where the wall is for the algorithm. And uh, if we are looking for the answer, uh, all of you would probably give a different answer. For me, this is the hist uh, history of data against this, uh, from Israel. This is a startup that was established by the students of Tel Aviv University who realized that we are uh, sharing a lot of information about ourselves, and despite this fact, the data around is not sufficient to for the algorithm. So in a small study, they started asking uh, Tel Aviv inhabitants to come to the studio, and the algorithm uh, were transforming, converting that into artificial um, images. None of these people existed. You would not recognize these people if we didn't have the eyes. So these fictional or artificial images are sent to companies. Uh, and chatbots algorithm learn based on these algorithms. So we want these algorithms, the power of algorithm to be reliable, to be true. And we are giving it something that is not true, that is a synthetic reality. I cannot, I don't have to introduce Michael Zuckerberg. A couple of uh, months ago, we had a break in Facebook. There was no Instagram, no Facebook, no WhatsApp, no Messenger. Somebody configured uh, the router, the server in uh, this was password-based server. Uh, to, uh, it, it took six hours to put it back up. On the other part of the world, in Taiwan, a startup that diagnosed a social need was established. People invested in electromobility because before it became fashionable. TikTok, uh, rickshaw bikes without fast charging. So they they uh, established a certain cupboard with uh, charges. People uh, put their the battery, uh, charged the battery, took it uh, out from 2015. People saved 25,000 emissions into CO2. So six hours gap was sufficient. People could not log in and use Facebook. So six hours was enough to change the behavior. First, they, the interest was not catching up with the level from outside, and then the company broke down. So the problems with server correcting data of the biggest machine in the uh, um, uh, Silicon Valley has an impact on a small company in Taiwan. I was wondering what kind of example uh, precision or accuracy of algorithms. And I wanted to talk to you about the sector you represent, agriculture. So in China, how do we breed animals, pigs? When you look at it, you can see that thousands of animals refer to virus and infection among them. People are thinking how to separate ill animals from healthy animals and how to recognize that one animal is in. So CCTV cameras collect the real data, real images, and then neuron-based system uh, recognizes the, the behavior of the mouth of the animal, indicating this animal is ill. So uh, recording the movement of an animal. If the animal behaves differently, this must be separate because potentially this animal is ill. So we put a square around the animal 
The uh, employee from three to five minutes has the time to separate this animal from the herd. We can say, okay, this is China. We are living in Europe. Uh, we have uh, different regulations. So if you visit Microsoft lab in Warsaw, you enter on the left side a big screen. You stand in front of the screen, and this screen is collating your data. After two to three seconds, you, there is a yellow frame, and in the upper part, you will have the date of your uh, the, the, the year when you were born. So this is very easy to identify us. We share our uh, year of birth on Facebook because uh, on one day. When we have birthday, people uh, congratulate us. We wanted to show what big data is today and uh, the use of data today, because it seems that neuron-based network can recognize our data. This is what differs us, how we live, how we practice sports, whether we do it or not, whether we are healthy or not, what is our diet, what is natural, our gender, our age, and uh, our race. So we differentiate between the data and we can have, through analyzing the eyelid, recognize the age because every day our eyelid looks different, usually worse. So this shows how precisely we can be when we talk about neuron-based systems and algorithms. This is here another example. We are living in the age of development, in the era of development, affecting also your sector, your area. This is a photograph I, I made in Science Museum in London. This is a tool established in 1935 used for EKG. This is 90 kilograms. A hundred years forward and EKG is in our phone. We have apps that can record every day in the morning through the mimics of our face, check the breathing parameters, EKG, heart rate, 80 years passed by only. So if we stay on a meadow in the year 1000, we would need, and then we wake up in 1500, we, the meadow was a meadow, uh, there was no difference in the trees, the village was more or less like that. Uh, if today, if you fall asleep in uh, 2000, then if you wake up later on, you can see significant difference because even the air smells differently today. So this is my introduction, a bit longer introduction into data, what kind of value the data has today. And the first issue in farming, which is of fundamental nature, is the tools uh, that are used for data collection. Of course, I'm talking here about satellite pictures, uh, which uh, provide very precise, of course, surface-based and large area, but uh, they're able to provide very precise information based on the reflection of lights about the parameters of a given area. I'm talking about temperature, I'm talking about salination, I'm talking about the characteristics related to the certain type of soil. Today, even, satellite photographs can recognize the quality of the soil which is located in a given area. In addition to the fact that it is today that, that it is from satellite photographs that you know about the energy crisis, because they show how much light is on today and how much light was on three, four, five months ago. This shows the revolution that we have in this area today. And what is used is electromagnetic wave. The length uh, of the field of electromagnetic waves is investigated. And based on that, based on that you can uh, acquire very detailed parameters related to large areas. 
But this is large area. We also have fields that are just a few hectares, not large. From the point of view of microsatellite, this is still a small area. And for this, we use Internet of Things. So we're treating technology as a certain collective gathering. And I'll show you an example which is in a way agricultural. I'm sure you remember the forests in the Biebrzeński National Park. Uh, peat was on fire. For 25, sorry, for 21 years in Poland, there was no new national park. It would be a, a tremendous loss. This is not a natural park because grasses form uh, by being cut every spring, but this is a habitat for a huge number of birds, etc. So they didn't even cope using drones because, first of all, there was an attempt to locate the, the starting points for the fire by using land-based infrastructure. That didn't work because there was terrain is so uneven. There are pots and bogs. Then drones were used. These were flown uh, over the area of Biebrza River in order to find out where smoke was the densest and based on that diagnose that this is probably where the starting point is and this is where we have to put out the fire. But it turned out that the smoke made diagnosis impossible. But the combination of satellite photographs, so Polish macro uh, satellites, uh, a company near Wrocław sent them in macro scale, together micro photographs from drones and superimposes macro and micro photographs helped us diagnose the locations where the density of the smoke was the strongest, the biggest. That's how starting points were located. And the national park in Biebrza was put out, the fire was put out. This shows the level of precision we're dealing with today when you use data. This is an, of course, we use drones. I, I showed you uh, earlier a, a, a film, which is not fake, which I got on my hands just a few days ago, which shows how today drones are used in Asia uh, for spraying uh, plant protection material and fertilizers. Of course, we use data uh, that, that is acquired from thermal maps, satellite photos, but what it looks like, and please start the film, it looks like from a science fiction movie. The original film is very long, but uh, I, I cut it short to the absolute minimum. Here's the question that I was asked on stage by Łukasz, asking when will these technologies become commonplace? While there are technologies for artificial intelligence to diagnose the well-being of orchards, which in my opinion will never become fully common, well, on the other hand, this technology, using drones to spread materials such as fertilizers, that's technology which in the matter of a few years is believed to be able to change the agricultural sector very strongly. Another trend where technology is used is, is drives, predictive drives. It's not a mechatronic uh, in, not in a mechatronic sense, but in mechanical sense. This shows how drives and how drives will be used in the future. These are autonomous cars. When we hear about autonomy, we immediately feel we're going to find ourselves in San Francisco and we'll be in a vehicle that's not driven by a human, but it can move very precisely on a certain area. But today we don't have the legal frameworks to, to move around in those vehicles. But fields are less regulated than towns, but we still don't have legislation for this. But in the matter of the next seven years, we can't hope to have it. But autonomy has levels between one and five. It is believed that 80% of the use of autonomous vehicles at levels one to four, which is where they are able to go independently, drive independently, but under human supervision. And that 
area is agriculture where these can be used. And finally, when we talk about uh, technological trends in farming, when we think what's the strongest game changer, it's clearly vertical farming. In order to show you the scale of it, I run social media that is related to technology and I about half a million people uh, follow it. And I always show you innovator, in, 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 innovators. And I get 200 information weekly about innovation. I asked uh, a, a lot of help, uh, requests for help and promotion comes from vertical farming. I have three or four requests per week about vertical farms. We look today at vertical farms as a, a, a way to optimize things in terms of production. So we are able to produce year round. We are able to provide growth conditions to plant that will allow us to be able to provide a certain category of product for 12 months of a year. We can provide normally radish four to five months a year. Vertical farms are allowing us to deliver 12 months a year. But that's not the most important advantage of vertical farming. The most important advantage of vertical farming is the price of the products. The second is health. Because if a plant is grown in optimum conditions, you, in modern vertical farms, and the largest cluster of such farms is near the town of Wrocław in Poland, artificial intelligence constantly monitors the param growth parameters of the uh, plants, such as air temperature, humidity, light intensity, pressure in a vertical farm. All the information is collected, which is then um, me means that a traditional uh, vegetable or fruit becomes a superfood because we optimize the content of the plant. And that's the most important attribute of vertical farms, which fits into the environmental trend, which is increasingly important in retail uh, market. Desert farming. I'm describing uh, makeway.com, www.makeway.com is where you can find recent information about uh, an innovation in desert farming and not an innovation which is some sort of embellishment or something rare, like uh, Wukas said, something that will never come true, but innovation that already today has been implemented in several thousand locations worldwide, which is self-sufficient water reservoirs with fish. A system was created, the startup is called, it's not really a startup anymore, but the name is Plant Echo. A system was created with the so-called photoreactors, photoprotein reactors, which use photons, uh, solar light, to produce animal protein, which means that we are able to go to the desert, middle of the desert, install a huge water reservoir, and then over a period of approximately two months, just put light to it, and through the parameters that are maintained in it using Internet of Things and artificial intelligence and optimization uh, systems, we can develop algae, which are fodder for fish. Fish are introduced into the container, the reservoir, and the way it's designed, it self-cleans and it creates a closed circular system which works without human interference, where there are certain periods where fish is picked up, so it becomes circular economy in nature. It's a perpetual mobility which is ent entirely regulated by the forces of nature with an initial push, original push given by humans. The technology that uses sun rays to generate animal protein. Biotechnology is an absolute revolution. This is bioprinting, printing tissues, we're he now able, and it's not fiction, this is happening. At the Department of Chemistry, Warsaw University, such things are happening every day. We are able to collect live cells from any living organism, hook them up in hydrogel, then make them into a shape of a missing organ, print them using a classic uh, 3D printer, just sterile in, in, in a class A sterility, to build by 
bionic organs. I'm talking about uh, animal organs. I'm talking about meat, so so it's it's um, a food product, but also medicine. The first project for a bionic spleen is Professor Michał Wszoła in Poland, where he picked up elements from an animal uh, spleen and he created a bionic organ for transplants for people uh, uh, who need a life-saving operation, a transplant, using a bionic organ, which is transplanted in a different location, by the way. And this is technology which has application, of course, first in Asia, in farming. At the moment, this is an attraction. Uh, a curiosity, but I have to tell you that it's more and more frequent. Only a few years, only a few years ago, when I visited the trade show in CES, the largest technology uh, trade show in Las Vegas, serving this meat was a rarity and it was totally exotic, something completely unusual. Today, in more and more restaurants, there is a menu where this meat is listed. It can be served. This is one of the very many examples of biotechnology. It can also be used to multiply animals, to use somatic cells, which provide an opportunity to, to take cells from a single animal, single sex, and to create animals that have two genders. This is the so-called somatic cell that has the capability of becoming any cell of a, a body. We pick it up from the skin of animals. We can then transform it into a, a sperm and an egg. And from that, we create an animal which is the child of a mother-father, a single animal. Blockchain, the dispersed registers, the, all the data and the usage of this data requires today certainty from us, certainty of facts. We need to be able today to go back to a parameter. We don't do it manually, of course. The, 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 the backbone of data is used by algorithm. But today, when we make a decision on in a vertical farm to revisit data that was acquired based on uh, uh, environmental factors from that same farm two, three years ago, collected in a certain way, undeniable way, by using blockchain. Nanotechnology, the most well-known example of nanotechnology in agriculture, used for many years and known to you, is silver, which is considered to be an element, the element of life. It uh, uh, allows uh, um, plants to heal cuts faster, to be used in uh, uh, plant cultures. Nanotechnology allows to use nano silver, that's what it's called, to extract from it those components which make it possible not only to heal plants but also to optimize their growth. And this is one of the areas for nanotechnology. And this is more or less the direction in which we are going today generally as the farming sector. Today, your um, farms, places where you employ people, in five to ten years are becoming going to become data collectives. And what you do with the data is up to you and only up to you. But at the very end, I would like to go back to a certain metaphor. Because if we ask ourselves the question, what's the best known thing that was born in our part of Europe, of course, in technology and innovation, then most probably you would say maybe it's Booksy or Skype or znanylekarz.pl, well-known doctor, the services that are well-known, but none of these. The best known born in our part of Europe is the word robot, 102 years ago in Prague, in the National Theatre of Prague. Karel Czapek staged a play, Universal Robots of Rossum, which was a play in which robots were supposed to help people in doing the daily chores. The word robot comes from the work 
concept robota, which in Czech means slave work. The robot was supposed to be a slave of human and do exactly what the man tells, what the human tells. And initially, at the beginning of the play, that's what happened. Robots help. In the middle of the play, robots started replacing humans. And at the end of the play, they killed every living thing on Earth. Very well-known play, first staged in Prague, then in Poland, and finally on Broadway in New York. And with it, the word robot circled the world. And 102 years ago, uh, Karol Czapek implanted a certain gene into that word. What happens when we cross the border between human and technical? That will annihilate humans. So making decisions about implementing technology in your local place, in your farms, uh, businesses, when you do innovation, always think back to it. I always follow the affiliation of LEM Institute. Stanislav LEM always was able to look at technology with skepticism, which means that if he saw a technological solution, an innovation, he could very quickly, and that's the beauty of his vision and the dur durability of his vision, he could always look at it from the point of view of positive, optimistic approach, but also skeptical, and I wish you to do that. Look at technology not just negatively, because that's what people do, it's the easy way out just be negative. But with that negative approach, always look at it with a note of optimism. Put these together and make informed decision with openness and awareness that farms, businesses, and locations that do not innovate at some point will not be competitive anymore. Because the drive for the development of humanity by technology has never been as strong as today. Thank you very much for your attention.